Uh, Happy New Year's, everybody in the house. Uh, I think if someone told me a week ago that I'd be standing here addressing this body as a minority leader, I would say you're crazy. There's no possible way, but as we all know in life and in politics, things happen fast sometimes, so here I am. I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the courtesies uh, you've shown myself and the conference over the last few days and uh, as we work through this transition process. I really do appreciate that. It has been a difficult time for all of us. Our former leader, I think we all would agree, put his heart and soul into this job and the unfortunate circumstances that happened to him uh, causing his res resignation or stepping down from the leadership. Um, frankly, I think it was very hard on him. It's been very hard on his family and it's been very hard on all of us. So with that being said though, we need to turn the page. And I know you had a friendly and professional relationship with Brian and Mr. Speaker, I hope that we can continue uh, that relationship. Crystal, thank you for your kind words. I also want to thank you for the courtesies that you've shown me over the last few days. Uh, in the past, maybe we didn't work all that closely together, but certainly under my new position, I think we'll be working very closely together. And I have some very, very good news for you. Mr. Goodell is going to continue on in his position, so you'll be able to work with him. <laughs> Mr. Barkley, can, he, can you just remind him he must always start with the Constitution says? <laughs> yeah. Interesting, Mr. Speaker. I opened my drawer, and there's 10 state constitutions in the bottom of my drawer. But... Uh, to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I look forward to working with you. Well, we don't agree very much on policy. As the speaker said, as the majority leader said, there's no reason we can't uh, be respectful of each other. There's no reason that we can't realize that we have differing point of views. And where possible, there's no reason that we can't work together to try to move this great state forward. And last, thanks. And last, but certainly not least, I want to thank my colleagues in the Assembly Republican Conference. The trust that you've placed in me, it's really a true honor. It's a true honor, personally and professionally. It makes me incredibly proud to lead this conference. It's made up of so many dedicated men and women who despite, we're outnumbered, we realize that, we know that, but we, know, we don't get dispirited, and we're gonna to continue to our hard work and the hard fight that we've done. So, cheers and thank you. So, as you know, Mr. Speaker, we're on a condensed schedule this year. I think it's a good thing, but as a result, uh, we have a lot of big issues that we have to address immediately. And I think on this side of the aisle, and I think a lot of New Yorkers would say the first thing that we need to address is bail reform. We've, we've seen, we've all seen the stories out there. A Hoosick Falls man is accused of using an ax to break the windshield of a female victim's car. While she was inside the car, he was caught and he was released. An Albany man was charged with recklessly choking and stabbing a woman to death last July. He was caught and he was released. In Brooklyn, a woman was arrested twice within days for anti-Semitic attacks, menacing, harassment, and attempted assault charges. This only happened because she was caught and she was released. In Rockland County, a man struck and killed a 35-year-old mother of three, was unlicensed, and left the, scene, left the scene of the incident. He caught and released. And just this week, you may have seen in the news, just yesterday, a Cohoes man was accused of recklessly causing the death of a six-year-old baby boy. He was caught and released. Unfortunately, my colleagues, these aren't the only examples. This is what's happening. This isn't fear-mongering. So don't take my word for it. I'm not trying to grind the political acts. Don't take my word necessarily. We need to listen to the people out there, the professionals. We need to listen to law enforcement officials, judges, district attorneys, all have sounded the alarm. And now the Senate Majority Leader, Attorney General, Mayor of New York City, and even the Governor have indicated that this law needs to be reformed. These are the facts, my colleagues, and it's incumbent that we act on these facts. So if I may, Mr. Speaker, let me provide some other facts. By all indicators, 
we are seeing the strongest national economy that we've seen in recent memory. In August of 2019, the national economy had reached the longest economic expansion since 1854. 1854, unemployment has dropped, wages are increasing, and jobs are being uh, created at an incredible rate. And with all this good economic news that we have, it's been great news, we find ourselves in New York State with a $6.1 billion shortfall. This is a fact, my colleagues, Mr. Speaker. These are the facts, and it's also a fact that as a result of this, we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions going forward. And if one thing I can think, I can speak for my colleagues in our conference, what we strongly believe on this side of the aisle is that we can't tax our way into financial health. <laughs> my colleagues, New Yorkers already pay too much, and they've been paying too much for too long. The fact is our state tax climate rankings are way out of step with the rest of the state. And let me give you some more facts. We are 43rd for real property taxes. We are 43rd for sales taxes. We are 48th for personal income tax. And our overall tax climate is 49th in the country. Only one state's worse than us, 49th in the country. These, my colleagues, these are the facts. We have another financial crisis that stands right in front of our face, but continues to be ignored. New York State's debt is 57 billion and climbing. According to the DOB's own projections, by 2014, total debt will reach more than $66 billion. That's an increase of almost $10 billion. We're the second most indebted state in the country, and our per capita debt is the fifth highest per capita debt in the country. These, my colleagues, Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. Short-sighted financial decisions today will produce a stressed state economy tomorrow, and our youngest citizens will be paying the price. So with those facts in mind, it's no wonder that 77,000 New Yorkers have left New York State in 2019, more than any other state in the union. That's more than 200 people per day. Look around this room. It's about the equivalent of the amount of people that are packing up, getting in their cars, and leaving New York in their rearview mirrors. To provide a little bit more perspective on that, there are 28 counties in New York State that have 77,000 people or less. And that population's moved out. That would, that would move all the population out of counties like Cortland County, counties like Herkimer County, or Schoharie County. Just a few more facts and I'll wrap it up, Mr. Speaker. We've already lost 1.4 million residents to the rest of the country since 2010. This is the largest of any state. Over 180,000 more residents have moved out of New York State than moved in from other states in the previous 12 months. And since 2010, the national population has increased by roughly 19.5 million. That's nearly 16 times the rate of growth than what New York State has. Now, I don't mention these facts. I don't mention facts about bail reform, facts about the state budget gap, facts about state debt, facts about population loss. I don't do that to be a contrarian. I don't do that to make people feel bad. Rather, I'm doing it to illustrate that we have a problem. We have a problem in New York State, and we need to do better. But Mr. Speaker, saying that, I believe we can do better. I believe we can offer a more affordable, a more safe, and a more prosperous life for the 19 million New Yorkers that we all represent. So as I said at the beginning of my speech, I stand here. I'm honored and grateful for this opportunity. I'm eager to work with everyone in the House and I again want to thank the speaker and the majority leader for the courtesies and, that they've shown me and the professionalism that they have given to this body. But let's get to work, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to address this house.